Welcome to the Westside Kings Church Podcast, a time where outside of Sundays we continue to wrestle with how the surprising grace of Jesus affects our everyday lives. So shall we begin? I think so. Part three of our conversation around wealth. And I'm going to start with a text. Um, and this is a text from Mark's Gospel. Uh, it's from Mark's Gospel, so like most texts in Mark's Gospel, it's short. And... Uh, it's in Mark chapter 12, verse 41. So Mark chapter 12, verse 41. One verse. Well, no, there's more than that. Oh, but I thought you were just <laughs> sorry, you were don't, stopping it's at not one that verse. Short, okay. <laughs> Mark 12, verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. So the line that we've been kind of talking about throughout this uh, three-part conversation has been, did Jesus really mean that? Yeah. Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. Does Jesus really mean that? Yeah, well, I, th- I think this comes back to, you know, some of the conversation we've been having over the last couple of weeks of, one, defining treasures and what does that look like and what does that really mean is that a number or is that something Mm. deeper is there a deeper meaning which we've kind of wrestled through um some of this is is the is the grace piece too in it of it's actually not such a religious act of hey this is what you're supposed to give Mm -hmm. but rather is is coming back to the heart issue of how you're responding to something Mm -hmm. and and where your heart is giving out of because i think you know and i would you can jump in on this too david is i think there's there's something to be said in the initial first read of this story Mm -hmm. where something that jumps out of out to me is it's really easy for me to be generous when Mm -hmm. i've got extra Mm-hmm. I think it's easy for us to give when we have a lot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, sometimes we still struggle to maybe let go of certain things, but at the end of the day, it's a whole lot easier for us to um, to give out of excess mm-hmm. instead of giving within, you know, limitations. Yes. Um, and, and that's what I see Jesus really starting to poke at here as a, at a first glance without diving too deep into the text. Yes. If we're just reading a story for what it is. Um that that's what I'm seeing here. Yeah, and I think that's that's an interesting, um, you know, there's an interesting sort of pace uh, to to think about that. In fact, one of the texts that I want to get into at some point during our conversation today is in Second Corinthians nine, and where Paul actually kind of leans into that sort of space as well when he's talking about the Macedonians and the and the Corinthians, and and, and he sort of. Um, you know, he, he sort of basically has had to say to a few people in a few situations, like, you've got to stop giving because you actually, you're getting yourself in trouble. <laughs> you're almost, you're giving to the point that it's, that it's too much, you know, because you, you don't have enough for yourself in that sort of sense. You, you know, he said, Paul recognizes that you're hard pressed, but you still want to give. So, so there's an interesting question there for us right at the start is, is how much of our, generosity comes from excess and not from well well let me ask the question like that is it generosity if we're just giving from our excess right yeah um, yep. and and does that you know and then and, and, and it's a real question is it you know i'm not saying it's not uh, of course it's generosity at one level but is it doing the same thing for us you know, is it is it driven by the same principles? Is, is that making sense? Yeah, and I wonder even like how how giving out of excess affects your own heart differently from giving within you know to use not entirely great language, but within your limitations within mm-hmm. some sense. Like I think of I have two I have two hamburgers and I'm hungry. I don't really need two hamburgers. It's easy for me to say, Hey, David, are you hungry? Mm-hmm. And I haven't you know, and I give you the extra hamburger that I have. Mm-hmm. 
it's going to be a whole lot harder for me. One, because I've got a dad bod to feed. Um, t- if I only have one hamburger to mm-hmm. say, I'm really hungry and I'm genera- and you're hungry. Yeah. Generosity out of that goes, well, let's split this. Right. Yeah. And, and, but I'm, st- I'm still a little hungry out of that. I'm fine. Half a, half a burger would keep, would, would sustain me in some senses. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that's a more difficult give. Then well, I've just got this extra one, so I'm just gonna toss. Of course, I'm gonna toss it. That's an easier brain connection piece to make. Then right. I physically actually have to consider what I have in front of me, mm-hmm. and go, if I have, if I break it in half, actually, do I still have enough? Well, probably. And what does that do to my heart? Right, like what's actually going on with inside of me in that thought process? Mm-hmm. Because there's a whole lot more thinking going on. I'm willing to bet. Mm-hmm. There's a whole lot more we're considering. Yeah. And I wonder about the stretch that happens in those moments compared to giving out of the excess. I don't know. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. So there's a couple of things. One, um, and I realize nobody else can experience this and I don't even know the answer to this. So, you know, I am now self-consciously wondering about the nature of the example you chose just then, because on the way here, I did spin in for a drive through burger. And I'm wondering if the smell is kind of busted. On my, you and got that's, busted. And that's why, why you yeah, chose bu- yeah, to busted. use that particular I can smell that example. Big, I can smell that big man. <laughs> um, uh, my uh, friend, George Snyman, um, from Hands at Work, often has asked the question, you know, does it hurt when you give, you know? Um, and, like, that's not a pleasant question to be asked. Um, but I think it's a really profoundly important question to right. ask. You know, does it hurt when you give? Um not out of any, like, I don't, like, George is a phenomenal person, a graceful person. So he's not trying to create you into some sort of self-flagellating sort of, you know, process. But there's a question about if, well, one of the things we're going to say consistently is that Jesus is pretty much the model for everything in the New Testament, right? Yes. So the model for giving in the New Testament, and Paul's going to say this in Second Corinthians 8, Jesus is the model for giving too. And Jesus, what is the model of Jesus giving? Well, the first model of Jesus giving is him giving his life for us. So, so the biblical take on, or the New Testament take on generosity, uh, and that's probably an important point to, to make because where we're going to go in the conversation today, yeah. but the New Testament take on generosity is that your model for giving is going to be cruciformed. It's going to be yes. cross-shaped. And, um, and I realize, you know, after the, the kind of, uh, conversations that you and I have been having in the lead up to Easter, you're probably <laughs> yeah. like, "Oh no, <laughs> you know, I know, I know where that one leads." <laughs> yeah, it's, don't go back into it's this. A, it's a lengthy one, but so so if if Jesus is the model for how we live, and and the Bible makes the connection of He's also the model for generosity. Yeah. Then then at some level, Georgie's question, "Does it hurt when you give?" is a Christian question to ask. Right? Yes. But can't happen in judgmentalism because Jesus never motivates us via via guilt and he doesn't motivate us via compulsion or or anything like that it always has so so the question is oh i feel guilty like what i'm going to say later when we get to second corinthians putting a lot of trailers in for second corinthians yeah. but but i'm convinced that what paul pushes in in second corinthians is if you give out of guilt or compulsion you just don't bother right it's not actually yeah. that's not generosity and, and what god wants from us is generosity not money right um, and and that for me is a really key a really key piece that that I think you see in this particular story, right? Yeah. That that you've got somebody giving a lot of money, yeah. And somebody giving not very much money, yeah. And you've got somebody giving generously of everything, and somebody not giving generously of everything. Yeah. And the fascinating thing is that, that that Jesus is interested in the not much money that's given with the right heart, than the lots of money given really with no thought well yeah and i mean it it comes back to the you know when i we've been having so many conversations in different circles all of my conversations with you are a bit blurred together but i think (laughs) it was in somewhere along you know these these lines we we, we've had the conversation to say Mm -hmm. well god doesn't need your money yes so at the end of the day you're right it actually it it has nothing Mm -hmm. to do with money because god doesn't really need it Mm -hmm. and we i think that was maybe last week we talked about how, how god actually wants your heart Mm-hmm. And that is, and that is where I really, you know, I'm resonating with what you're saying and hearing mm-hmm. the difference between, you know, 
yeah. even just giving and generosity mm -hmm. because giving i think that's a word um that we put a lot of emphasis on maybe even within mm. a western church context mm. because that always comes you know at certain times of the year or budgets tight and some yeah. of those things right but really i think what we're trying to get at in the conversations that we're having is mm. a larger picture of what does it actually mean to be generous yeah. with our wealth and wealth being again mm. beyond just the number in our bank account yeah because what I'm hearing you say is the generosity piece to giving and to being generous mm. is again things like our time, things like some of the skill sets that we mm. have. Like there's a generosity yes in that and how we handle those types of things. Yes. And I think that, you know, it's always worth remembering the feeding of the five thousand story where you know, somebody can give a very small amount to Jesus and Jesus can do some pretty incredible things with a very small amount. Now, that principle, if it's true of food, is also probably true of finance, right? Um, that that you can go, here, Jesus, here's five loaves and two fish, and, well, that's enough to feed a crowd of 5,000. So if we can live in the absurd for a moment or two, you know, Jesus can do more with the widow's might, as it's known in the kind of old King yeah. James story, than he can with the with just the spare change of of the people that are not really invested in the giving. For me, what's fascinating, and I think you see this consistently throughout the New Testament, that the question is: look at it, they gave out of their wealth, she out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. The defining features in both in both situations are the people themselves, right? So it, it's it's actually giving. I think giving's about you, right? I don't think it's about God. So so don't don't give because of what God demands of you. Almost in that sense, like give because of of what's going on in you. If, right. If that makes right. sense. Right. So, you know, like go back to what we were saying. Jesus needs needs your heart. Yeah. And you see that in the Psalms. You know, like in, you know, God's God's like you know. Like I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Like I, I don't need your offering. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. It's like like we don't don't give to God because He's like like short of money or something right. like that. So the Christianity, I think, calls us into redefine how we think about giving right. for very very different reasons. Right maybe, in that sense. And well, why don't we start to go there then? Okay. Let's let's start to why don't we start talking about t the you know this idea of tithing and okay. giving because you're you're tiptoeing around it and you're teasing <laughs> a lot of people. Um, because I I think I think you're right. I think there's a you know, there's a concept in church, mm. you give because the Bible says so, and it says 10%, yes. and we're not 100% certain where it says that, but we've heard it so many times that yes. we assume that that's what you're supposed to do. Yes. But what I'm hearing you say, and where I agree, is actually why we give is because we follow a sacrificial mm. Jesus. So our giving is simply about us responding and living out the ways of Jesus in the world around us. And yes. part of that is sacrifice yes and that's where the giving piece comes in am, am i i'm tracking with your thoughts and yes i mean i think so i mean it depends a lot on a person's background i suppose at some level how they've encountered the notion of tithing sure right? um i mean this has been quite an interesting research area for me over the years because like fascinatingly up until um i, I think it was the 1920s or 1930s um tithing was a was a legal requirement in the uk right so so you were actually you paid a, a every tax. every person everybody in the village area tithed towards their local church now it wasn't 10 percent of all their income sure but the church had a right up until 1936 to expect a payment from everybody in the village Very, right? i did not know that <laughs> yeah so so like um now, it, it, the reason this allowed then everybody in the village then could use the church for weddings and funerals and, and all of that sort of stuff I as, see. as well. And the pastor was expected to be a kind of figurehead of the of the village. Yep. In 1936, Britain basically, you know, abolished that law. And that has brought in the last hundred years a lot of reflection on, so how do churches get money, right? Because, right. because we've changed the way that we go about doing yeah. that. Um, now, for a lot of... Uh, kind of contemporary churches they've decided to utilize tithing as, as almost a model of discipleship and to say this is you know really good disciples of the church give 10 percent of their income you know to the church um 
I, there's a lot of things I want to say about that, right? But I'm going to try and say a few things kind of briefly and surely. There's, I'm you, you already know this about me, but I'm not a fan of, of, of tithing, right, as a, as a biblical model, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's important that we realize that something can be biblical and not necessarily Christian, right? So there are, there are things in the Bible that Christians don't do and don't follow, right? Um, and, um, and a lot of them are in the Old Testament, yeah. right? And a lot of them, they don't follow them because Christ brought something different, right? And, and that sounds like immensely controversial, right? Uh, but, you know, but actually, when we read the Old Testament, we realize quite quickly, yeah, we don't do sacrifices, we right. don't do these offerings, we don't go to the Day of Atonement, you know? Yeah. So for some reason, out of sync with everything, we're still holding on to this idea of tithing. And I, I've sat and listened to sermons from pastors saying, yeah, no, it's different. It does. It doesn't get kind of moved on, even though tithing was essentially a, a temple funding system, right? So God institutes tithing in in the Old Testament as a way of ensuring that the temple had funds, right? The temple used those funds to look after the priests, right? Because they because you had this whole in the breakout of of the land of Israel. The, the tribe of Levi, who were the priests, they didn't have land, right? Yes. So, so they, they, they had no way of supporting themselves. Yeah. They did that by, you know, by, by basically the tithe, right. right? The other thing the tithe did was it helped the widows and the orphans, right? So it was the funding center of yeah. the country. That, that it was essentially the tithe funded the Israelite social welfare program, right? Uh, if you didn't have enough, you would go to the temple and they would ensure that you were okay. Right? right. So, and there's a lot of that in the Old Testament of a kind of social welfare type ideas. There's rules around, you see it in the book of Ruth, rules around harvesting that you're not allowed to pick up dropped wheat because the people that are less fortunate come in and pick that yeah. up. So you see this sort of, this sort of idea very commonly. Um, now what's fascinating is if you actually calculate really what the Bible says, tithing probably costs the average person even upwards of 20% of their annual turnover in that sense. So this 10% idea, which you see referenced as a tenth, but when you actually start adding up all of the tenths, right, right. <laughs> it starts to get quite complex. By the rabbinic period with Jesus, tithing was becoming insanely legalistic uh, to the extent that if, I, if you bought food from uh, a Gentile or from somebody who hadn't tithed, you owed the tithe on that food. So tithe, untithed products were transferable, right? So, I so pay you got my, stuck with the tithe. Yeah, yeah. So I pay my tithe to the temple, go down to the marketplace and buy a bag of rice from you, and you haven't tithed it. I owe 10% of that bag of rice. It's like asking if it still has a lien on it, right? Yeah, that's the... yeah basically, basically. So it became kind of, so it was a very dense and complex process. The other thing, I'm just going to throw this out there. The other thing that I've yet to ever hear a pastor teach um, is that every seven years, you got a year off from tithing. And um, <laughs> That's an easy one to forget, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like for some reason, that one hasn't been so, so commonly taught upon. Yeah, so basically you had a, you had a Shabbat, a Sabbath yeah. year of tithing. And uh, now, of course, because you also had a Sabbath year of uh, fields as well. So it's kind of logical at some level. If there's no, no money coming in, yeah. th there's no money going out. And that might be worth remembering when we think about who pays tithes and so on and so forth. But essentially, it's worth me saying this, that the tithing principle was established in order to support the, un the, the less fortunate. So you either had the, 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 those unable to earn in the priestly system yeah. and those unable to earn because of life circumstances. So tithing was... Israel's social welfare system at, at some level, which does make you ask whether maybe in the contemporary world we already have maybe taxation to some level performs some of the role of, of tithing sociologically. Right, yeah, and some of the of social sense. welfare, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, but we've kind of brought it in the contemporary world and said, no, no, this is how you have to be uh, in church, right? Which, to be honest with you, if a church wants to run that way, that's up to them. Right. If a church says, hey, part of our membership structure is here is, is we would like you to pay 10 percent of your income to the church so that so that we can keep going. That's that's fine if a church wants to set that up as their standards. The difficulty for me is, is when we take that idea and then try and give it biblical weight. Right. Right. So so like in one sense, you can you can make any rule you want from a membership, a group, you know, you and me can make a deal. So let's take 10 percent of both of our income and put it into a central fund to help poor people. Like it's up to us. The problem is, is when you then say, but we're going to add some biblical weight to why you need to do that. And then for me, even bigger problem, when you then start adding 
um, threat or jeopardy to it, right? Right. Yeah. If you don't type questions, right? Um, so quick highlight of things then. Um, this is some stuff which I find there's a really helpful book out there by a guy called Stuart Murray. Uh, he wrote a book called Beyond Tithing. Uh, and he lists through a kind of list of things regarding tithing that I just want to highlight really quickly that I think are helpful sure. right? and jump in yeah. with your own thoughts on yeah, this. Yeah. But he, a couple of things that he mentions. Uh, the first thing that, that why we probably, um, we, we probably want to think about, about tithing perhaps uh, a, a, a little bit is that number one, it's very legalistic, right? And, and sure. anything legalistic should, you know, it's, it's obviously the one I'm going to start with, but it's anti-grace. Yeah, right? it should so, send warning bells yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. So some lights start flashing on the dashboard that, hey, you know, something's going a little bit wrong here. Um, and, and there's a sense of which what we do is, is we create this as the bottom line. So I've got friends, I've talked to a lot of pastors over the years about this, and they're like, yeah, tithing's the bottom line, right? So if a Christian's going to give, it needs to be 10% or more. Now... I've gone back with several pastors over the years to this text in Mark chapter 12 and said, so what do we do with the text like this? Yeah. Right? Um, because that doesn't seem to be what Jesus is identifying going nope. on in this particular uh, situation. <laughs> the New Testament always sees legalism as an obstacle to discipleship. Right? So, yeah. so when you actually start to bring this in, legalism prevents maturity in the bible's view because legalism obscures the work of the holy spirit right because when you say when you say well this is just the number you can essentially just switch off your brain and switch off your spirit yes and and just reach the number right and it becomes simple check boxing yeah you right? sim you stop you stop listening you stop asking jesus yes i mean it's like that in i would say with anything theological like in some senses you stop becoming a learner mm -hmm. like i mean it's yes it's what we do with our kids at the most basic level because yeah. they need it at that stage in time. Mm -hmm. But as a society, we expect kids to mature and grow mm -hmm. and start to be able to sort this on their own and yes. not have to have an entire list of do's and don'ts. 100%. 100%. Yet we always tend to seem to do that when it comes to faith. Well, even think concepts. about where we started with this series, right? The 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 rich young man that comes to jesus yeah what should i do yeah do right and jesus basically says it's the wrong question yeah right? and then he, but if you really want to do something do that and it's too much for him right yeah so so bear in mind there's there's a, a question going on there that we see even in the story at the temple with jesus you know some people are coming in they're throwing in large amounts but but it's somehow it's not ticking Jesus' boxes, if Jesus even has boxes to tick, right? So first thing is, you know, beware of anything legalistic. Yep. And the way that we tend to teach tithing within churches is legalistic, right? Give your 10%. Like I, I met a guy once who's, who, who had a book in his pocket. And, uh, and every time that he encountered any sort of money, he would write that number in his book. And then, and then on, on the next column, put in what 10% of that was. And then at the end of the month, he would go down and he would... He would add up all those numbers, and that was the number that he wrote on his uh, on his check and dropped into the church at the end of the month, sort of thing. And it yeah. was it was a to the penny you know, legalistic system, you know. And, and, and some of that though can some of that though can be a heart thing, mm -hmm. because I I think there's something to you know to say about the potential conviction of, mm -hmm. of the work of the Holy Spirit in his own, yes. and I'm and I'm you know him and I don't, yeah, but yeah. I think it's an important thing to make note of. Hundred percent. Because I think there's something to say about the the personal conviction piece mm -hmm. in that. Because maybe for someone that is the conviction piece is to go. Mm -hmm. Money is a big deal for you, and yes, you know the spirit pokes at at you and says, mm -hmm. so you're going to get a notebook, yes, and you're going to track this because this is our starting ground of how we're going to spur yes, you perhaps. on in this, perhaps. But and, and I mean it, that's a maybe a bad example because. Mm -hmm you know, to be that rigid maybe is missing some of the point. But, <laughs> yeah. but I, but I do, I do think that's an important side note is to mm -hmm. say like what can seem legalistic to one may be a oh, genuine, yeah. maybe a yeah. genuine heart piece in another. And I think yes. that's the, you know, and I've seen that in a wide variety of mm -hmm. things growing up mm -hmm. um, in what I would call a very legalistic, Yes. Not like my parents, but, you know, grandparents and great grandparents as far mm -hmm. as like no movie theaters, no drinking, you know, no drinking, no playing cards, no. Yes. 
boom, 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 boom. And I say, well, that's really legalistic. To them, it was a deep conviction piece. Yes. Yes. And so I've had to learn even in my own life to appreciate yeah. the conviction of others, even when yeah. it disagree. Like, Oh yeah. So there's, no, that, I mean, great maybe that's a l- very large conversation that we don't have time <laughs> to get into, but I, I wanted to maybe make note yes. of that to say actually, the, and that's where the heart piece Oh, absolutely. And we can't judge that in someone else. Yes. We can only wrestle that in our in ourselves. Yeah, no, 100%. Now, I'm trying to decide how cheeky to be at this stage. Cause, Always you know, cheeky. You know, so. But there's also the side of that. You're, you are 100% right, right? You know, but you also have Matthew 23, where Jesus says to the Pharisees, you know, you tithe all your dill and cumin, and then you turn your followers into twice the sons of hell that you are yourself. Yes, right? so, yes. <laughs> So I'm being facetious at of one course. level, but you're absolutely right, and and that's I think that tension's important. That on one level there's, um, you know, there's the let's not knock the conviction in someone else, you know, but let's also be careful that their conviction doesn't get passed on. Yes, to, they, to you to, totally, and become legalism in yes. that sort of sense. Yes. And that's why I love Jesus's, you know, you know, you, you become twice the son of yeah. hell. You know, he, knew, he really knew how to work a crowd. <laughs> he knew Jesus. how to make friends. Yeah. So you know, I I, ha- I had a friend. Um, growing up, I say a friend. He was he probably he was he was more of a mentor at some level to me. Very elderly man, and and he was absolutely stuck on Sabbath. You know, so like his car ran out of gas on a Sunday. He got out and walked home, right? Because he's like, I'm not <laughs> right. going. You know, yeah, yeah. And uh, and I, as I, when I was younger, I used to think like this guy's nuts, right? But then when I got older, I realized although I don't want to live there this is him earnestly working out what it means for him to follow Jesus. Totally. Right? And I don't want to knock that earnestness because no. I, what instead I need to do, you know, is, well, somebody put it like this. It's the different, it, it, it's, it's the difference between religion and tradition, right? You know, so, so, so tradition is your grandfather wore a hat. So you wear a hat, right? Religion is you wear your grandfather's hat, right? Right. And, and, and or legalism rather is you wear your, 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 I don't like to knock on religion, but you know, in that yeah. sense of, uh, what are you carrying on? So this this um, elderly mentor, you know, I I learned from him at a distance. I thought I want to be earnest like that, but I don't want to get caught up on stuff that's legalistic, right? If that if that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, and I think that would be where you know. So th- this character that I encountered, who wrote everything down on a, on a on a book, like for me, when you listen to him unpack it, it started to sound very legalistic. Sure. Yeah. It was, yep. it was yep. I need to make sure that I'm in the right column with God. Right? Yes, and you go okay. Now we're in a little bit of trouble here at this yeah. point. Um, so the, what's let maybe let's stop there for a second. What's a good What's a good question to ask then, to wrestle with that idea of is this becoming legalistic in mm. my life? Like is is there a question that we can ask to to wrestle that out ourselves to say if I'm wondering about something and mm. we're talking specifically around wealth here, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. more you know for the sake of this context, the yeah. the generosity piece. But I think in general, there's a lot of areas that you can stumble into legalism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm, you know, I'm putting you on the spot here a little bit to say, you know, is there a question that we can carry with us to say, this is how I be, ca- this is how I be cautious mm-hmm. to make sure I'm not stepping out of grace and walking in grace yeah. and into, uh, you know, a legalistic yeah. mindset. Um, I, th- I think, why am I doing this? is is a really good question to ask um and i think that that is you know you ask that question to yourself and and try and honestly answer it why am i doing this and if the answer is in any way or form something along the lines of because i think it will help me do better with god (laughs) yeah then then you may have just turned left you know, at the <laughs> at the intersection of law and grace, right. right? And that is so hard for us, right? Yeah. Um, but but one, uh, Brennan Manning, one of the great writers about grace in the contemporary era, from in my mind, so his book like a uh, ragamuffin gospel would be, you know, a kind of go to. I, I would say for anybody that's not, you know, uh, Brennan's a Catholic priest, um, alcoholic, just blew up his life on several situ- right. in several contexts, and you know, and and, and he's. You know, he he does this thing. He's like, I want you to imagine that Jesus comes to your house <laughs> for supper, right? And I'm, I'm I'm quoting from memory here, right? So, yeah. But you you know, and he sits opposite you, and he looks at you. And Manning says, and as he looks at you, you realize that he knows 
everything about you. <laughs> right. Every bad thought you've ever had, everything you've ever done, everything. And while he looks at you, all you feel from him is acceptance. You know, and and, and that's what we get, you know, w- w- with Jesus, you know. And, and so, um, and I think it was uh, Philip Yancey who said, you know, one of the difficult journey, his amazing book, What's So Amazing About Grace. Yeah. He, he asked the question, you know, how hard is, us, is it for us to realize there's nothing we can do to make God love us less and there's nothing we can do to make God love us more, you know. So, so for me, l- the, the alarm bells of legalism are, if I give this, let's bring it back to generosity. If I give this, this will set me right with God. And that that's subtly under a lot of tithing conversations, right? That yes, God loves you, but if you really want to be a proper disciple, you're going to achieve this level there. Yeah. And, yeah. and so legalism becomes highly dangerous, I think, uh, because it sneaks up on us because we love it. Uh, you know, because, oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> because we like to know that we're doing better than somebody else because we like to pour all of our money into the offering. And, and we don't like Jesus sat at the other side of the road going, yeah, but that lady there, you know, there's some people, I don't know if you've ever heard this, is some people uh, have kind of theorized that, that what you get going on in this particular scene is that they used to, some in some situations, so we don't know for sure if this is exactly what's happening in Jesus's context, but the temple treasury was kind of somehow some sort of copper-shaped funnel where you put your money in. And so I, I, I read somebody once imagining that, you know, you've got this. So imagine being in the temple and you hear somebody come and they pour their money in. It's like, and forgive me because this is going to sound horrible on a, on a podcast, but like in a ting, 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 you know, as right. all the money goes in. And yeah. then you hear, ding, ding, right? Um, and you've got the social shame of, you know, the rush of all the coins dropping in and then two little right. clinks of, of, you know, um, and then you've got Jesus going, that's the one right there. And so Jesus is clearly leveling off that sort of playing field. So for me, how do you watch against legalism? Why am I doing this? The, the reason that we do anything as Christians should be, this is a journey I'm battling with constantly, but should sure. be that I'm simply motivated by God's spirit to do it. You know, yeah. uh, will I do this good? You know, if I do good because I think it will set me right with God, the real question is, is that really good? Right. Uh, is it really, you know, um, uh, Jacques Derrida, um, you know, wrestled with this quite intensely in his kind of, you know, existential type sort of postmodern philosophy. I'm not embarrassing myself, but not quite remembering where you place Derrida amongst the philosophers. But um, I don't think you're embarrassing yourself. <laughs> I'm not sure I could name many philosophers. But, so but, uh, I am, I, I, um, you know, Derrida asked the question whether a gift was ever really possible, right? right? Because because as soon as we give somebody a gift, we immediately then there's there's some sort of partnership created. Yeah. And then and then we there's you feel the need to give something back and and so on and so forth. And 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 realistically I think we can so easily get caught up with that within our ideas of generosity. And tithing fits that well for us. It gives me a rule and a parameter, you know. Uh, you know, one of the reasons Jesus is terrible at being God is unlike all the other gods in the world, he just doesn't seem to give us a lot of rules. And we actually quite like rules because they help us know where we're up to in, in that sort of that was sense, a theologically you know? loaded statement of Jesus <laughs> and why he's terrible at being God. But, mm. well, you know, so no, but I just, you know, that's, no, I know, that's, I know, that's, I know it, I, yeah, we take our idea of what God's supposed to be like. And one yeah. of the things we struggle with as Christians is we don't find that in Jesus, you know, so yes. thank goodness he's terrible at being a God because our gods are barbaric, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so the first thing is legalism. Yeah. I, I think then there's also a sense in which I'm going to bounce through a couple of these kind of quickly. Sure. Um, I think that it's biblically bad bad reading to defend tithing as a Christian model, right? Because because it's just not talked about in the New Testament. The only times tithing is talked about in the New Testament, it's done negatively, right? It's Jesus criticizing the Pharisees. Yeah. I mean, several key points in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 being one of the big ones, where the conversation is focused around money. Paul is talking to a group of non-Jewish people so they haven't grown up with tithing through the Old Testament system. They haven't learned this in the synagogue. And Paul talks to them about generosity and never mentions tithing once. Right? So if tithing was a Christian principle, you would expect Paul to be teaching it to his non-Jewish converts. Right. And he never does. Right. right. And in fact, does something quite, quite different. And um, the other thing that happens is 
this, let's tie this to the legalism kind of loop in that sort of sense, is that, that we, I've heard a lot of pastors push the idea, well, tithing is just a good principle, right? Give 10%, it's a good principle to guide yeah. your life by. Yeah. And that may be true, right? But as I asked one pastor once, you know, if you think it's a principle, why is it when you preach on it, you quote Malachi 3 about robbing God? Because now it doesn't sound like a principle. Now it sounds like a law. Yes, very <laughs> you know much know so. I mean? So if all of a sudden you go, here's a really good principle. And by the way, if you fail to meet this principle, you're a robber and you've robbed God, right? Yeah. Um, and again, Malachi 3 talks about robbing God if you, um, you know, if you don't tithe. But it's about this temple structured system within a particular nation and how they work through their social welfare. Right. Remember, and this gets lost all the time, and this is still a New Testament principle. God is phenomenally interested in the state of the poor and the underprivileged, right? Yeah. So, so how do you love God? Like, we separate this all the time. We talk about, well, you love God, and once you've figured out loving God, you love your neighbor. But if you actually read the Bible, <laughs> you love God by loving yes. your neighbor, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so this idea that these two are separate and that loving God is above loving your neighbor, you know, Look at how Jesus balances that out, but that's an Old Testament principle as well. Right. So, namely, then, if you stop tithing, and therefore people, the poor, are are, are not protected and, and are therefore dying, guess what? God's not happy about that, right? And that's not the way God wants us to live. So, so you start. To and see yeah, that and you see some of that in the Old Testament. We've yeah. talked about that too, right? Where, mm. where God's like, your worship is like clanging, right? Like, yes. He's yes, like, I want, absolutely. I want justice. Yes, I, I want like this outward working within the world. Hundred percent. So, so for me, this is the kind of piece that we 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 have to to kind of wrestle with. That then ties us into another problem: is that so often the conversation about tithing is purely financially and money focused. Yes, um, yeah. and and we've, I think, the, the kind of Christian notion that you see throughout the New Testament is 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 twofold, right? Um, Giving is way more than just money, right? It, it, it's also all the other things you've had. But the other thing that happens in, in my experience of watching tithing being taught is that the sort of the, the, the message comes, you give your 10% to the church and then you do what you want with the 90%. So 10% is God, 90% is yours, right? And you just don't see that in the New Testament. In fact, in fact, there's a fascinating little story where 10 lepers come to Jesus for healing. And they, Jesus says he'll heal them. They go away, get realize they're healed, and only one comes back. So 10% of the lepers come back to Jesus. Right. And Jesus, his question is, what happened to the rest of them? You yeah. know? Um, and so for me, the f biblical stewardship says everything you have is God's. Right. right. So, so it's not a case of leave God your tip, you know, and you know, 10% is not a phenomenal tip <laughs> you know yeah leave god your tip and do what you that like wouldn't even be considered acceptable in a restaurant <laughs> exactly, in some senses yeah. so 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 leave god your tip and do what you like with the last yes. the rest uh, you know actually the bible never really pushes that because what what we end up with is essentially this 10 percent then gives us a pass on stewardship uh, and, and what you seem to see the bible push towards is never an ethic of tithing but it's an ethic of stewardship what do you do with what God has given you. Yeah. You know, everything you have is a gift, you know, so you don't get to give your 10% and then ignore the poor person at the side of the street because, why? Well, hey, I've already done my giving for today. Yeah. So, now, that ties in then, thinking about this whole story with Jesus at the start in, in Mark chapter 12, that ties into another aspect of, of tithing that's problematic in my view that you see even critiqued in the Old Testament is that 10% is different things for different people. Right? So we say often that, ah, well, the reason that tithing is good is it's fair, right? Everybody gives 10%, right? But let's just be honest, giving 10% of your salary away or your income away is different depending on who you are, right? You know, if, if you're on minimum wage, 10% is going to cause you problems if you're trying to, you know, live in Calgary, you yeah, know. Strictly with inflation. Yeah, you're living in Calgary, trying to run a car so you can get to your minimum wage job. Like that, a, a renting a house, your car, and your minimum wage job, 10% is going to hurt, right? Whereas there's others of us, 10% means maybe our vacation's not quite as good as it was the year before, or maybe I upgrade the car in two years' time instead of, instead of this year, right? Um, for some people, 10% might not even be noticeable, 
right? You know, that, yeah. that, that like it's conceivable that somebody might actually be able to give away 10% and it not even make a difference, right? And therefore, 10% may be about equality, but the Bible's not always about equality. The Bible's about equity. And, uh, and the way I have, you might have a better way of explaining equity and equality than I am, right? But, but here's the take that I have, and sure. I like this. Equality says we all get to start at the same place. Right. Right. Equity says we all get to finish at the same place. Right? So so, you know, um, there's there's a there's a, a, a picture that tries to describe it once. Equality, it's, it's three kids and they're trying to see over the fence to watch a ball game. I don't know if you've seen this. I don't know. And one of the kids is tall. One of the kids is medium sized. One of the kids is really small. And, and it says equality. And they're all given the same size box to stand on. But the small guy still can't see over the fence. Right. So then they show what equity is like is actually the small guy gets a bigger box than the tall guy. And that's what equity is like, that you might get different. So tithing is equal, but it's not equitable uh, in that sense. It right. actually might hurt one person more than the other. So from my opinion, tithing is generally taught, um, well, it's generally taught from a point of privilege, right? If you're in a position that you can give up 10% of your income, it's easy to teach that as a principle. Oh, you, yeah, 100%. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so so I, I am absolutely convinced that it's actually it's actually an unjust system. Tithing in the Old Testament was designed to, to protect the poor, um, you know, and so that they could lean on the rich. And it came in line with Jubilee and Sabbath years and first fruit yeah. offerings and everything like that. When we extract it from the Old Testament and just simply offer it as nothing more than, you know, a, a 10% system that applies to everybody. I think we overly burden some, and if I can say this rightly, underburden yeah, others. I know, you know? I just, yeah, um, I know what you're getting And, and so, you know, coming right back to Georgie's quote from Hands at Work, does it hurt? You know, d- does, yeah. does your generosity drive you into a sort of cross-shaped model? Right, that yeah. No, it, it 100% makes sense, and I, and I love that word, stewardship because i think Mm -hmm. it gives new legs of life to an understanding around generosity and and managing and understanding what you have Mm -hmm. and how we respond you know as as jesus leads yes in in how we navigate that um and and so I, i i think that's good and i think this comes to the point you know that you're kind of talking about in you know, Second Corinthians and mm. Paul, uh, you know, as he talks about this cheerful, like this giving yes. of, uh, you know, God loves a cheerful giver. Yes. Um, which we, which is funny because we, we love to stamp it when we're like, um, I mean, we don't do this at Westside, but, mm. you know, I've seen other churches that are like, the ushers are going to come around with the baskets <laughs> and remember that God loves a cheerful giver, right? Yes. Like, but I, my if if i'm understanding what you're saying and in my own reading of this yep. paul is talking larger mm. than just what we've narrowed it down to yes. when it comes to being a cheerful giver yes and and so listen it's worth noting that like paul's in a sort of situation this is going to sound like a terrible thing to say because his situation was like really bad right so but paul you know he, we're two pastors sat having this conversation right you know, Paul's in a situation where he's trying to raise money to to help some really struggling people in Jerusalem, right? Um, and also survive himself, right? And, you know, it, it, I get that it it would be it kind of easy for a couple of pastors to sit and go, well, tithing's a great way because if everybody actually buys into this, that helps us, you know, keep the church afloat, look after our own families, you know. And, yeah. and so, so like, I, I, I feel like there's also a question of ethics in it all that says it would be easier when you've got a little bit of history on your side that, you know, for, for several, you know, for several hundred years, people have been teaching, this is what Christians do if you want to be serious about being a Christian, is you give this much money. Um and and I think that is a challenge for a lot of pastors. If you're in a church context where maybe people aren't generous, and therefore there's that temptation to go, well, if if, if we just lean in the legalism, at least that keeps us going. Yeah. Right? Paul has exactly the same challenge. What's fascinating to me is that he he resists that temptation to transfer from grace to legalism. Yeah. Right? So he says, I know you don't have much money, right? I know things are tough for you, you know, and, and then he throws out the, the you know, the, the famous line um, in, in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. 
But what's the ob- opposite of sowing sparingly isn't sowing excessively. Paul says, but whoever sows generously yeah. will also reap generously. So again, notice what he's done. The one contrast is volume, right? Yes. So, so if you sow sparingly, sparing is a volume descriptor. Yeah. So you expect the opposite to be a little bitty offering, big, great offering. But what Paul does is he actually changes category. So whoever sows volume sparingly reaps volume sparingly. But whoever sows, and now it's not volume, now it's category of heart, right? So whoever sows with the right category of heart, yeah. generous, that's where their reaping well, comes and, from. And I think that's an important note to make because I think this is where then it starts to dip back into the conversation we had last week mm. around, you know, prosperity gospel and this idea yes. of if you give lots, Jesus is going to yeah. get like, so cut the big checks because yes. the big checks are coming back your way, which well, is not yeah, what Paul's getting at. Well, think about this. Second Corinthians 9 verse 6, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, sows generously, reap generously. Like, that could be a heading over the story that we told at the start of our session this evening, right? Right. You know, whoever sows generously reaps generously. The rich people came and they gave sparingly, sparingly, you know? Yeah. And then whoever sows generously, this lady came and she gave everything that she had, but it was only two coins, right? So you can literally categorize the Mark story from chapter 12 into Second Corinthians 9 verse 6, and it fits perfectly in there. Yeah. And you go... Paul's just channeling Jesus here, right? He's, right, just, he's yeah. just going, you can, yeah. you know, you guys are going to have to read this other book after Corinthians. It's yeah. called Mark. And, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, gonna, a, it's a decent book. It's going to help you here, you know. Um, but then he says this, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, right? You know, um, now I don't understand how you can take Second Corinthians nine verse seven, and tithing, and say they work together, right? right? Because you've got one saying you've got to give this ten percent in order to meet the discipleship standards that God sets, and then the great apostle himself writes to this group of kind of slightly just all over the place Christians to pull them into order, and what he says to them is, "You decide," <laughs> right? and not reluctantly or under compulsion. So again, go back to what we said at the start. It becomes a heart. It's a, it's a character issue. Paul wants you to give from where your character is up to because that's what God can work with. That's what God can, can you know, motivate something differently mm-hmm. and all that. There's, you know, <laughs> I, I always use this example, and I've yet to meet anybody that doesn't prove it true, but nobody really likes paying taxes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And unless it's an election year, the impression I get is the government doesn't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? They don't care whether you like paying it or whether you don't like paying it. They just want you to pay it, right? Yeah. In some sense, that's almost your tithing model. You know, if you said it, this is the minimum standards, 10%, yeah. there's a level of which, you know, it doesn't really matter at some level yeah. whether you like or not. Paul, however, says, no, actually, that's all that matters, right, is whether this is coming from the transformation that God has made in your heart, mm-hmm. right? Now, <laughs> warning, let me sound briefly pastoral for a second, or not pastoral, but like a, like, like a, like a Western pastor. There's, if you read a text like this and say, this is fantastic, because I've never wanted to pay 10% to the church because, you know, yeah. I don't even like what they do with the money. Now I get an excuse to pay 4% and be happy with it. Paul has done something revolutionary, and it's slightly, slightly cheeky at some level. Because on one level, this immediately sounds great, right? You should just give what you've decided in your heart to give. Right? Um, that sounds way better than 10%. But what if the Holy Spirit's working on your heart? Right? And the point oh, is yeah. also... This isn't a one-off decision. Paul's saying this is how you go about generosity now, is you make a decision. So that decision might be different every week, right? And what if the Holy Spirit starts working in your heart and it starts cranking it up, right? And then you think, well, this is fantastic because, you know, now I don't need to worry about tithing. And then you sit down and say, okay, what does it look like to give the way that Jesus would have me give? Now, 
Now it's an open playing field. Remember, <laughs> Everything's on the table. <laughs> yeah, basically, right? <laughs> it's all there. Remember, there's a lady that started the whole, did Jesus really say that off? She put in everything she had. Yeah. Right? It was, and now it was all, she, this, this is all the money I've got. Bang. It, go, it goes in, you know. Um, you know, is it, like, if you want a safe system, go with tithing, right? That would be, you know, like, like honestly, you know, that will be more straightforward. Yeah. Um, the beautiful thing about the, about God is, you know, if you don't have much to give, he might not require much of you, right? Um, and if you do, he might, right? God's never going to drive us into into sort of stupidity. I, I can fundamentally believe yeah. that. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, and this is where stewardship becomes a great e- e- example, that, that actually there are times where being a good steward is looking after your 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 family, right? And there's also a time where you realize being a good steward is we have more than we need. Let's share it out of abundance. Yeah, right? and that's the and that's the spiritual discipline journey discipleship process too. Because I because yeah. I agree. Sometimes there is that like mm. we think we're bad, a, a quote unquote bad Christian. I know we had that conversation a bit mm. last week too, but right like of well, is it wrong to, you know, to care for my family mm. because I'm supposed to give this? And you just find yourself in this wonky system of, yes. well, well, no, God <laughs> deeply loves your family and yeah. your care for them as well. Yes. So don't sacrifice that. 100%. God, God would God would never want you to say, you know what, we're, we're homeless yes. because I've given everything away and yeah. now we're in trouble. God would say that's a lack but- of stewardship. But then, like, there's two things in mind. I love Len Sweet's um, comment, and he's like, what is, it, what is a Christian actually trying to do when it comes to money? Yeah. And Leonard Sweet's line, which I really love, is here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to die broke, right? So essentially, like, he said, what you want to do if you're following Jesus is by the time you get to the end of your life, you're giving it all away. Right? Um, he says you don't want to get to the end of your life with stockpile. Right? Which is, like... <laughs> I, and I get what he's saying, and I and and I would agree, and I would agree. Yeah. But there's also like, and this is just my own like Western brain that wants to yeah. fire, mm. right? That's like, yeah, but what about my kids? What about right? Like, because yeah. that's that's the thought process that we mm. have. We buy life insurance, right? Like, yes. in all well, yeah. death insurance, depending. I'm, my my dad <laughs> sells it, and he might not like that I call it that, but you know, but that's really what it is. In, yeah, you know, at the most simple level, but um, right? Why mm. to make sure there's this excess, and and yes. I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm not like yeah, yeah because no, again, there's a stewardship piece. It makes sure people are cared for it and some of that stuff. But the reality is, is the Western mentality is we're gonna live as luxurious as we can. Mm-hmm. Some people stretch that and that's again a missing of a stewardship piece and you actually put a family in a deficit and that can Mm. be devastating in some senses um but then we also want to say but we also want to stockpile and have all of this Mm. stuff so that at the end of life we live comfortably yeah and then there's all this extra yeah that gets passed on and it keeps growing from generation to generation yes and you know and and it's it's interesting then you see that, that paul kind of this is why two corinthians uh, nine, six, seven, eight are just phenomenal texts. So, so six is this change of category. So sparing, category of volume, to generously, category of heart. Then you get, hey, by the way, here's a model for giving. Don't let anybody talk you into it. <laughs> yeah. Just give whatever is in your heart, but just be aware of the fact that God's working on your heart. So this is going to be scary <laughs> yeah. at some point. But also God loves you being cheerful. So if you can't give cheerfully, just don't give. Yeah, right? forget Because it. the point is God doesn't need your money and it's not coming from your heart. Yeah. Right? So, so don't do it. But then verse 8, and this is an interesting one. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, right? Um, you'll abound in every good work. Now, it's interesting. The language of goodness in the ancient world was often about charity, right? So, so it's interesting. God's able to bless you abundantly so that at all times you will have all you need. Let's just circle that word need. Yeah. So that you can abound in giving more money away right? and giving more stuff away and giving more time away because good work is about what you do for others. But for me, it's this word, and this is, I'm, you know, I'm not the first person to say this, but it's that word need. Yeah. And we yep. have wonky perspectives on what need is. Uh, and I think that one of the things that circle back, back round is, is actually decide in your heart what to give, but ask God to fundamentally help you 
define what it is that you need. Right? Um, and now there's a couple of things we can do with that. We can we could, and this would be a warning. I would say you you could live in a in a completely bound up, you know, poverty mindset. Right. Um, I, I, I think, you know, you could immediately say, OK, I'm going to have one T-shirt and one pair of pants and that's that's all I'm going to wear. I'm going to give everything else away. And, I'm gonna, you know, but there's also, I think, a, a side of that where, you know, Jesus taught us how to live abundantly in the same sense, but not you get what I'm sort yeah. of scratching at. Yeah. And so so we've got to get that sense that we miss so often in the Western world that we either go one extreme or the other extreme. And, and Jesus came to kind of help us model, I think, healthy living. I'll give you life and life to the full, Jesus said. So there's there's more to it. Christian life should be attractive. It should be wholesome. It should be um, it should be something that you want to be part of in that sense. But I think the sense of that in, in this passage here in Second Corinthians is we got to do some work on what we need, <laughs> because if God can genuinely supply our needs. You know, and but God sometimes doesn't appear to be supplying our needs. Is the problem that what we think our needs are, are maybe just wants and desires? Does that make sense? Yes, and you're leading into a whole nother conversation, and we're running out of time. <laughs> so that's you know that's that's maybe something that we have to to table a little bit. Yes, it no, def- for sure. It, it definitely makes sense. Um, and, and I do think that again, yeah. and that's a lot of what we've been doing over the yes. last three weeks in general anyways Mm. is saying well let's maybe redefine a few things Mm. uh, and really talk about what are the definitions do we have the correct definition and if we have an issue with it is that because that's an issue in us yeah or right like yes or is the bible leading us you know amiss and so i think i would say this you know after you know three weeks talking about did jesus really say that jesus says that the the widow has given more even though she's given less i would say don't follow jesus if you if you think it'll just be a cheaper way to live <laughs> right um so you know even in verse 11 of second corinthians 9 you'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion yeah. and through your generosity result in thanksgiving to god so like if you want to stay stingy <laughs> then jesus isn't the the you know like like if you follow jesus you're going to give more away right yep. if you really commit to following jesus so if 10 percent looks a lot in that sort of sense think i can't give up 10 percent of my income then genuinely i'd say probably best just give jesus some distance because because he's maybe going to go after more of that for you and but paul in this beautiful circle points out of course you know maybe you'll end up with even more to give away because actually it seems like you start acting as a conduit for God's generosity in that sort of sense. But I I always worry that what people take away from a conversation when we say, you know, I don't think tithing's a Christian model is that people take away from that a sense of, oh, so Christians don't need to worry about giving. Yeah. Paul actually pushes it other way. He says, I'm not going to define it. I'm not going to put rules on it. I'm not going to make it legalistic, but... (laughs) But if you open up your heart to God, you will become more generous. You know, at, you think about what I just said. If good works, if this whole idea of goodness in the ancient world meant charity and it meant giving and all that sort of thing, remember that one of the fruits of the Spirit is goodness. Right? Yeah. So, so you know, so there's a definite trajectory that God will take you in. And, and I've, I, you must have, you must have found this. I, I've found this when you meet people that are seriously like in love with Jesus and following him, they're invariably excessively generous people as well. That's been my experience. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. And I, I think, and again, this is why it's harder to live in grace as we've talked about on so many occasions. Mm. And because it's not just the, you can hear this and say, well, now Christians don't have to give. You can hear this and say, Christians don't have to care how they live. Right. Like, yeah, because grace abounds. And obviously Paul talks about that, but it's so easy to yes. change that that mindset. So, yeah. Anyways, that's where we land the plane. It's been a fun three weeks. 